Hello, is anyone here? Hello? <laughs> Lots of muted microphones. Can I start? Uh, one second, let's just uh, wait for a mm -hmm. few more people to enter. Okay. So, okay, we've got quite a few people entered now, so we'll continue. So, um, <clears throat> I hope everyone can hear me. My name's Tony, and um, my wife is Katerina. She's also here in the um, in the conference, but she's uh, got her camera off because she's not feeling 100% today. So, um, so myself and my wife, uh, we started TK Lingua in 2019. And now we work with a lot of vets. So we do these conferences to, to give uh, people a chance to practice their English um, in a kind of real life scenario. Yeah. Um, so we have four speakers and the first speaker, and I'm gonna to try to um, say the names correctly because um, it's very hard for me to, to pronounce Russian names. So the first speaker is Maria, Bondareva, is that correct? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so af afterwards, there'll be a chance to answer, uh, to ask questions. Um, but for now, over to you, Maria. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming. And today I'm going to talk about the diagnosis of uh, dermatophytosis. Uh, we would not talk about uh, etiology, clinical presentation, or treatment, because we have the time limit limit. So let's start. First, uh, first test, uh, it's a wood lamp examination. Uh, what should we know? Just only microsporum canis uh, that uh, had, uh, spe um, has special protein named pteridine. Uh, he has this uh, special uh, green eyes or maybe emerald uh, fluorescence. Uh, before, the use, uh, be before you use the lamp, uh, you should heat it. And of course, it's better to uh, work in a dark room. Uh, as we know, I hope, uh, Negative results uh, does not rule out the infection because, as I said, uh, only microsporum canis uh, can fluorescent. Uh, but uh, this positive uh, green eyes here uh, is suitable for trichography and culture. Uh, you can pluck uh, the hair, uh, put it on the mineral oils and microscope. Uh, what should we see in microscope? Just a moment, take a point. Okay, uh, we saw the hair, the hair shaft. This part is healthy, and this part is infection. Uh, in, with infectious, uh, we saw in the right uh, photo the healthy hair shaft, uh, and of course we saw uh, in the center this infection infect, infected hair, uh, which contains bits of the spores. Just a moment. Mm -hmm. So uh, the next uh, useful uh, test uh, for diagnosis is cytology. Uh, we use the uh, fastain, like a diff, or maybe diff quick. And what uh, should we see on a slide? First of all, the type of inflammation is pyogranulomatosis. Uh, we can see moment pointer. Hu huge number of neutrophil. Wait of neutrophils like that and macrophages in this left corner. And of course, uh, we can find uh, infection agent uh, which look like uh, dark blue bodies with unstained yellow like that. It's a spores. Uh, another type of diagnosis is a culture, is a gold standard, uh, standard for diagnosis of dermatophytosis. And um, it's really, um, uh, it's helpful for us uh, to use wood lamp, as I said, and plug the uh, ice green uh, here and put it on the agar. And uh, what should we know? False positive and false negative results are possible. And uh, we should be aware of molds because uh, molds are everywhere in the air, on the uh, here, also our animals. 
uh, and uh, it's uh, useful tests uh, for treatment control because we use the toothbrush and brush all the hair on animal and then put on an ego. Uh, we use Saburo dextrose ega and uh, sometimes DTM. Uh, DTM is a special tube with ega that, that contains uh, trace material. Uh, which uh, can check, uh, change uh, the color from um, yellow to red. And uh, as we know, sometimes uh, some doctors uh, can think that, oh, the color changed. So that's cool, it's dermatophytosis, but it's not. And what I mean, for example, this uh, DTM tube with uh, red uh, colored uh, ego, but if we saw on a colony, it look like black um, black cloud, uh, and it uh, it's not uh, it is not a dermatophyte culture is uh, molds and small videos how to microscope the colony. First of all, we put one drop on a black oh, sorry on a blue stain on a slide. Then we use cello tape. and put uh, on a colony. This is colony of moles because you saw, because uh, you see black ring around. And then put on a slide and that uh, you can microscope it. So uh, what should we see in the microscope slide? Uh, we saw three types sometimes. Mm three types of uh, dermatophytosis, but uh, the widespread, um, the most widespread is microsporum canis. Uh, point in a moment, like on a photo. We need to find this microconidia and uh, we can um, look about the shape of this uh, color of this microconidia wall and so on. So if we work with microsporum canis, uh, Colony uh, white, uh, woolly appearance. Uh, uh, usually, uh, microscorum canis forms abundant uh, spindle shaped uh, conidia with thick wall, with thick walls like on a photo. Uh, and uh, in the terminal ends often form a knob. Don't, do, I don't see in this picture, in this photo, but uh, on the picture from the book, uh, we can see this knob like a crown on the terminal end. And uh, microconidia uh, are composed of six or more cells like that. And uh, the next type of the next species of uh, dermatophytosis is microsporum gypsum. Uh, colony often flat, uh, maybe granular, uh, and uh, uh, color of the colony sometimes like black or like uh, brown or maybe cinnamon. Uh, microconidia contains uh, uh, up to six, uh, up to six cells. I don't have the photo on the microsporum canis in my life, uh, and the uh, wall are really thick, very really thin. Sorry, uh, microconidia a lack of terminal knob, knob without crown, uh, like a um, microsporum canis. And the next, uh, the last species uh, is microsporum trichophyton. Tri sorry, one, two, three, uh, trichophyton mentographitus. Uh, colonies are flat with a white to creamy colored uh, surface. Uh, microconidia have single shape uh, foos uh, and uh, had a thin wall without any knobs. Okay, uh, another type of uh, diagnostic methods, methods uh, is uh, histopathology. Uh, sometimes uh, it's needful test because, for example, wood lamp um, culture or wood lamp culture, trachography or cytology are negative, but we thought about uh, dermatophytosis uh, in clinical in, in a clinical stage in animal. So uh, for this biopsy, use a standard stain, but a special stain for gifts is a pass. Uh, and as we saw and we see in this picture, like that, the more bits around the hair shafts, like that. In this corner, it's better to visualize. And this is the hair shafts, hair shaft. 
And uh, the last one is a PCR. Uh, I don't like uh, these uh, methods because uh, it's a bad idea for treatment control because uh, PCR can, um, can touch uh, uh, primers, uh, DNA fragments, uh, not only from alive cells, uh, alive uh, spores, alive gifts, uh, but uh, from that one. And it's not a good idea to treatment control, uh, only culture. Uh, but sometimes it's really suitable for clinical disease. For example, you don't have microscope and maybe it's broken. Uh, and you saw, for example, um, fluorescence with the wood lamp uh, and uh, you can plug uh, this here uh, to PCR, but it's not a good idea sometimes because uh, the quality of laboratory sometimes uh, not not good as for for us, and uh, it's not uh, the first choice. It's it's this method is not method of first choice of the first choice. You should remember it, and that's all. Thank you so much. <laughs> Hey, <clears throat> excuse me. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very yeah. much. Thank you very much. Well done. You know, um, you do so, very, very well. Does anyone have any questions? Yes, yes. I had a question in the chat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I see yeah. it. Yes, Marina, I use uh, this lamp. Uh, I buy bought uh, two uh, for three hundred rubles, as I remember, and it's good. Uh, it's not a special wood lamp. Uh, it's um, Lamp for um, check the money quality, maybe I don't know how it, how it's better to say, but it's really good work. Mm -hmm. And does anyone have, else have any questions? They would like to. Don't be shy. No, no more questions. Okay, thank you very much. It's strange because um, uh, I um, I plan to, to talk about nearly for uh, thirty minutes, so maybe. 20 minutes oh, but okay. <laughs> sorry <laughs> well it's okay it always happens like if you're a bit nervous maybe then yes a little bit and yeah yeah but don't worry you did very well okay um okay so we're going to change the order slightly here so we were going to have Ivan but Ivan's not here at the moment so we will um go on to Lydia so Lydia I'm not even I'm not going to try to say your second name because I'll make a mistake so um, Lydia, so over to you, if you could um, share your screen. Just a minute. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. So can I start? Yeah, yeah, please, please do. Okay, hello, dear, dear colleagues. Uh, my name is Lydia Birukova, and I am from Moscow, Russia. I am working in the veterinary clinic Vadalei, and my areas of specialization are cardiology, ultrasound, diagnostics, and neurology. Uh, I already made a report about the bladder management and neurological patients in general for the previous conference and now I would like to review the drugs that we can use in those cases. Uh, first of all, I have nothing to disclose and no conflict of interests. And I want to thank TK Lingua School for that possibility and inspiration and also for teaching me. <laughs> in addition, I thank all of you attendees of that, co of that conference for your interest. Uh, just to rem uh, just to remind a bit, uh, urinary complications are quite uh, common in dogs and cats with neurological dysfunction. And if not properly managed, uh, they can become even more serious problems than the underlying neurologic disorder and are associated with increased patient morbidity. Uh, however, they are usually preventable with careful examination and knowledge about managing the dysfunction. In that uh, report, I want to review what drugs are likely to help in managing the bladder dysfunction in neurological patients. Um, I am not sure that all the attendees have seen my previous report about the bladder management, so I want to remind you briefly uh, the bladder neurophysiology and types of dysfunction. 
Uh, and uh, in neurological patients, the regulation of the micturition reflex from the brain is disturbed. And I will talk about the micturition system per se uh, here. A very simplifying, we can talk about three so-called parts of the micturition system. Um, can you see my cursor? Your, your presentation, yeah, we can see. Is that the little? No, I can't. How can I make it visible? Uh, are you trying to make full screen? Yes. Oh, no. Okay, uh, no, don't no, no, do no, not, not, not full screen. Uh, uh -huh. I want uh, you to see uh, that little thing to show some part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I understand uh, we can't see it at the moment. Um, um, I'll just have a look what you can use. Uh, I'll tell you in a moment, sorry. Uh, at the moment, you can continue. Um, just tell us what you want to show. <laughs> we'll try to imagine what it is. Okay, maybe, maybe it's really no need to show because it's so... Uh, it I, I suppose it's quite understandable picture. So very simplified, and we can talk about three parts of the micturition system, the bladder itself, an internal urethral sphincter, and an external urethral sphincter. Uh, the urinary bladder is a hollow organ primarily composed of three layers of smooth muscle, collectively termed the detrusor muscle. The detrusor muscle contains adrenergic and cholinergic muscarinic receptors. Uh, better adrenergic receptors of the bladder are important uh, in bladder filling, and they are innervated by the hypogastric nerve, which originates from L1, L4 spinal cord segments in the dog, and L2, L5 uh, segments in the cat. Uh, muscarinic cholinergic receptors of the bladder are crucial for the bladder contraction, and they are innervated by the pelvic nerve, which originates from the sacral spinal cord segments. The smooth muscle of the detrusor extends... Well, Lydia, sorry, control. could I just interrupt you for a moment? I will only see your first slide, so where it says drugs for the bladder management in neurological patients. Lost. Okay, okay, okay. Uh -huh. If it's not working, you can try sharing the presentation again, maybe it will be better. Excuse me, I'm not very... Можете попробовать еще раз поделиться экраном, потому что сейчас ни ваш курсор не видно, ни то, что вы переключаете слайды. Сейчас... I'm sorry. It's okay, it's okay. Don't forget, it's just practice for everyone here, so it's... It's fine. So what, 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 what do you oh, see now? Fantastic. We can see your cursor. We can see everything. Uh, let's try moving the slides. Just didn't do anything. But now I can't move the slides. Okay, what should I do? Mm -hmm. should I do? Maybe like this. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yes. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Thank you very sure much. Can, I'm not sure that, that I can go back, but at least I can go forward. <laughs> Great, thank you. And what, what about the cursor? Yes, yes, we can see it perfectly fine. Is that white thing? Oh, fine, fine. Yes. Uh, where can I where can I stop? Uh, urethra. Uh, the smooth muscles of the detrusor extends into the proximal urethra and forms an internal urethral sphincter. Uh, the smooth muscle of the urethra is primarily innervated by the hypogastric nerve through the alpha adrenergic receptors. Uh, the distal urethra is composed of striated uh, skeletal muscle and forms the external sphincter, which is innervated by the pudendal nerve uh, through the nicotinic cholinergic receptors. 
Uh, this delineation is more clear on human anatomy, but for dogs and cats, the smooth and straight and musculature overlap, making differentiation between internal and external sphincters uh, less uh, clear. Uh, uh, here, again, the brief overview of the important receptors for efferent autonomic innervation of the bladder and urethra. Uh, for those of you who better understand not pictures but tables. And then um, here you can uh, see the schematic illustration depicted uh, the neuroanatomy and neurophysiology of urination, uh, the urine storage phase. Uh, the predominant uh, input for the storage is sympathetic. And what we can see here, uh, facil Where is my cursor? facilitation of the hypogastric nerve uh, and stimulation of beta adrenergic receptors in the bladder body, uh, facilitation of the pudendal nerve uh, and stimulation of alpha adrenergic receptors uh, in the bladder neck uh, and urethra, and inhibition of pelvic nerve. Uh, so as a result, we have bladder relaxation and urethral constriction. The bladder is filling. Uh, here you can see the neural control of urine voiding. Uh, the predominant input is parasympathetic and we can see here inhibition of, uh, uh, of pudendal and hypogastric nerves and facilitation of pelvic nerve, uh, transmitting input to cholinergic receptors in the urinary bladder. As, as a result, we have bladder contraction and urethral relaxation, resulting in coordinated evacuation of the bladder. Now let's talk about the bladder dysfunction. Um, the main types of bladder dysfunction are upper motor neuron or lower motor neuron bladder. Uh, the upper motor neuron bladder dysfunction is encountered with lesion between the pons and the L7 segment of the spinal cord. Uh, such lesions interfere with the, or abolish the detrusor reflex. And the hallmark of uh, upper motor neuron bladder dysfunction is increased tone. The urethral musculature typically become hyperactive, hyperactive and the bladder fills with urine until the pressure inside is great enough to force open the sphincter. Upon palpation, the bladder often feels turgid, uh, especially when enlarged, and is difficult or impossible to express manually. The lower motor neuron bladder dysfunction occurs with lesions of the sacral spinal cord or sacral nerves within the vertebral ca um, canal, or with lesions of the pelvic lumbosacral plexus area within the pelvic canal. Uh, these lesions also attenuate or abolish the detrusor reflex, but in a different manner. Uh, the hallmark of the lower motor neuron bladder dysfunction is decreased tone. Uh, both the detrusor and urethral musculature typically become flaccid, uh, and the patient constantly dribbles urine. Uh, the bladder is often difficult to discern as an isolated structure in contrast with the upper motor neuron bladder. Uh, slight abdominal pressure usually, usually causes urine to be easily expressed. Uh, but it is very difficult to tell by palpation if the bladder has been adequately emptied. Um, however, in some patients, uh, the unattenuated efferent hypogastric uh, nerve activity provides enough internal urethral sphincter tone to make bladder expression difficult because urethra is not relaxed. Um, uh, Detrusor urethral dysynergy is another disorder of micturition, likely of neurogenic etiology. Uh, it is a micturition abnormality due to an abnormal coordination uh, between the detrusor and the urethral sphincter muscles. Uh, the urethral muscles, uh, usually external urethral sphincter, uh, contract abnormally during detrusor contraction, resulting in abnormal interrupting of urination. Uh, the causes um, uh, the causes of that uh, dysfunction is not clearly understood uh, are not clearly understood but a lesion of the sp spinal um, 
pathways that inhibit the gypogastric nerve function uh, during the voiding fast could cause the dysenergia. And idiopathic uh, dysenergia is described in middle-aged large breed male dogs. Uh, now let's talk about drugs and we can use um, uh, different drugs to affect different parts of micturition system. Uh, I want uh, to remind that pharmacological treatment is only part of the complex therapy for the bladder management. Uh, first of all, is important, it's important to remember that in neurological patients, the voluntary and adequate micturition should always be verified. You should you have always give your patient a chance to voluntarily urinate and control how, how it happens. Uh, and okay, if you are sure that your patient has some bladder dysfunction, uh, you should you have to manage it. But I ask you, whenever you use presentations like that on any other sources for the management of your patient, always check the dosages, possible adverse effects, contraindications, and drug interactions in at least two formula formularies and other sources. And it's good to keep in mind that the most of dosages are empiric. Uh, and administration and dosage often don't have enough evidence base. I intentionally left uh, some cells uh, blank so that you understand that we don't have enough information here. Uh, for the beginning, I want to talk about uh, the drugs that can be used to increase the trouser contractility. Uh, first group is um, uh, parasympathomimetics or cholinergic. Uh, as a remark, it's quite important before administration, administration drugs like this to be sure that the urethral sphincters aren't contracted. Uh, for example, so the bladder can be manually expressed easily uh, or, use, uh, or you should use them in combination with medications that reduce sphincter tone. Uh, cholinergic medications um, don't uh, may even enhance the urethral sphincter tone. Uh, and uh, you should also remember that they would also reduce the ability of the bladder to store urine. It can potentially increase the motility of gastrointestinal tract and cause vomiting or diarrhea. Um, here you can see the dosage uh, PO means perorally. Um, and uh, it's better to titrate those upwards to avoid side effects. Uh, the next group to increase the trouser contractility is prokinetics. Uh, and um, first of them is cisapride. Uh, it, uh, it acts as an antagoni antagonist of 5-hydroxytryptamine uh, receptors and via that mechanism may enhance the acetylcholine release. It's usually used to stimulate gastrointestinal motility, but neurolo neurological manuals also mentioned it as a tool to increase the trouser contractility, especially considering that neurological patients can have problems not only with the bladder, but also with the intestine. And it is uh, that the same situation with the uh, Metoclopramide. Uh, met metoclopramide uh, inhibits the dopamine action, thus enhancing the cholinergic responses of smooth muscles. Uh, it usually used to enhance gastric and proximal intestinal motility and to relax the pyloric sphincter, but sometimes also can be effective for the bladder function. Uh, metoclopramide and cisapride should be considered when Beta Nicol uh, is an effective. Uh, if you want uh, to get the opposite effect, decrease the trouser contractility, you can use anticholinergic drugs. It's quite logic. Uh, Propantiline or, or oxybutynine chloride. Uh, they both have the same common side effects, 
uh, that are reduced gastrointestinal motility and constipation, dry mouth, and tachycardia. Um, and nowadays, uh, there are some additional drugs from that group that could be potentially used in small animal practice, uh, but uh, there are no information about it still. And but there is possibility for the future, and maybe it's good to mention them just for you to know. Um, uh, about uh, the second, about the second drug in that group, imidafenacin, the bioavailability is known in dogs, but at humans it has marked, but no information about the dogs still. And uh, uh, also. Uh, kind of kind of kind of new drugs uh, to decrease the true contractility is beta three adrenal receptor agonist uh, mirabigron and solabigron. Um, for mirabigron, uh, we now know that uh, dosage should be less than uh, zero point three milligram per, kil per, per, per kilogram, just because it was known that side effects in dogs with a single dose of 0 0.3 milligram, 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 milligram per kilogram. Uh, side effects include tachycardia, arrhythmias, erythema, vomiting, destruction of the zygomatic salivary gland. But at least the, these drugs are known to be safer in dogs than previous uh, group muscarinic receptor antagonists. If you want to increase ureteral resistance, uh, you can use beta sympathomimetics. Uh, and uh, in this group, uh, known drugs is phenyl, uh, phenylpropanolamine, uh, is a mixed adrenergic agonist, and it also can have si side effects, uh, and it can cause hypertension or urine retention, uh, sometimes anorexia and rest, uh, restlessness or irritability. Uh, sometimes you can see one dose or another dose. It's because in, in one book we can, you can find one dosage regimen and in another book another. So I just show them, show here both. Uh, the next group uh, to increase erythral resistance uh, is uh, noradrenaline and serotonin reuptake blockers, uh, imipramine, for example. Uh, it indirectly causes uh, alpha and beta adrenergic stimulation. Uh, and in some, recomm in some books, the recommended dose uh, is from 5 to 15 milligram per hour per animal. Uh, but uh, for that dosage, uh, it can cause uh, seizures, tremors, or hyper excitability. So maybe it's better to use more exact do dosage. Uh, some sources recommend also to use hormonal drugs for the neurological patients. Uh, usually, they recommend that uh, when uh, urine incontinence uh, is, is, is due to uh, sterilization, but in neurological patients, sometimes it also has an effect. But it's also have side effects uh, for uh, DCL still be strong. Uh, it can cause bone marrow suppression and sign of estrus and uh, testosterone uh, can cause prostatic hypertrophy and behavioral changes. Uh, to decrease ureteral resistance, you can uh, you can use uh, striat muscle relaxants. Uh, you just have to remember that uh, they also have the side effects, uh, and uh, especially for diazepam, it known that it uh, can cause hepatotoxicity in cats, so you should avoid it. Uh, and baclofen also is not recommended in cats, but just because we have no information about it for using cats. Uh, you can also use smooth muscle relaxants, uh, alpha antagonists. Um, oh my God. Um, uh, 
Phenoxy benzamine uh, has been shown to have carcinogenic potential, so it now uh, may be discontinued. Uh, and uh, it's better to use prazosine. Uh, for uh, tamsulazine, uh, it's a special remal in, in, in formula as that capsules should not be split and compounding may be required. Uh, and again, for cats, uh, that's a lim it's a limited clinical experience. Uh, remember also that alpha blockers uh, reduce not only systemic, but also pulmonary pressure. Uh, so the uh, caution should be used uh, for cardiac patients especially. And it's recommended that uh, one half of the calculated dose be administered, be administered for the first several days of treatment and the patient observe for clinical size of hypotension. Uh, uh, Tamsulazine uh, has a higher uroselectivity and that's why it causes minimal changes in blood pressure uh, and it should be the drug of choice for any patient with cardiac disease. Um, it's supported to distinguish between types of bladder dysfunction to determine which pharmacological agents uh, will be the best choice for improving bladder function. Uh, for the upper motor neuron bladder dysfunction, uh, first choice is usually alpha sympatholytics. Um, Clinergic should only be used in combination with uh, medications that reduce synchrotone if the first choice have failed to help. Uh, you can also use striated muscle relaxants and in chronic situation that uh, new, new scarinic receptor agonist, which we mentioned previously. Um, for the lower motor neuron bladder dysfunction, unfortunately, uh, there is no clear pharmacological method to reduce constant urine leakage. Um, Bet, uh, bethanicol uh, can be trialed to improve blood contraction, but there is no clinical evidence of effic uh, efficacy. And um, in cases um, where we have um, increased uh, internal ureteral synchrotron, we can use phenoxybenzamine. Uh, for the dysenergia, uh, uh, we can use drugs uh, to decrease urethral resistance. It's usually prazosine or tamsulazine. Uh, for tirazosine, it was shown huge amount of side effects in 93% of cases. Um, and in conclusion, I want to say that most neurological patients require some degree of bladder management, Proper understanding and the pharmacological management of the micturition system is important, but we have not enough data yet. So the development of evidence-based guidelines for the treatment and careful recording of data on urinary tract function in urological patients are needed. So here's a list of references and thank you. And if any questions, I would like to answer. Um, okay, great. Thank you very much. Your um, you you pronounced uh, the words there very very well. I I I can't pronounce most of those words, so <laughs> I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> Thank you. No, it was good. So, does anyone have any questions? If you do, then write uh, in the chat if you have any questions. Well, usually our listeners are unfortunately shy, but <laughs> if you're shy, shy yeah. don't okay. be. <laughs> It's just Don't practice for everyone. Well, if you think of a question, then you know, write it in the chat and then we can always come back and, and answer it later. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Uh, oh, Lydia. sorry, there is a question. Um, oh, okay. Uh, there we go, Lydia. So, hello, thank you. Uh, how can you comment um, the urinary problem in female big breed dogs after neutering? Um, it's uh, you usually count it as a change of tone of um, urethral sphincter because of 
change in hormonal levels. Uh, but it's usually not counted as a neurological problem per se. Uh, and uh, sometimes it can be treated with hormonal uh, drugs, uh, but it can decrease the effect of neutron. Uh, and uh, now uh, there are new methods for that um, complication. Uh, not kind of uh, like a local uh, local injection of botulin toxin in uh, the bladder neck by cystoscopy. It nowadays it one of the potential effective method for treating that. Thank you, Lydia. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Okay, if you could unshare your screen. And now we're going to go on to uh, Marina. Um, and she's going to talk about something which I cannot say um, <laughs> in pet rabbits. So maybe Marina can say what she's going to do rather than me trying <laughs> to, uh, to say the word. Okay, Marina, uh, over to you. Okay, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. And uh, do you see my presentation and the changes of slides? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can see. Okay, uh, so I will start. Uh, first of all, let me introduce myself. Maybe somebody doesn't know me. Uh, my name is Marina. Uh, I'm an exotic animal vet from St. Petersburg, Russia. I work in two clinics. It's a clinic named after Dr. Sotnikov and Katanai. And uh, when I speak that I am an exotic animal vet, it means that I'm a general physician. I do everything. Uh, that's why uh, I can speak about visual diagnostics, uh, dermatology, oncology, and so on. And today, uh, I would like to speak about tracheal bronchoscopy in rabbits. It's a new subject for me uh, because uh, our first tracheal bronchoscopy in a real patient we performed, uh, I think, about one month ago. Uh, so if uh, uh, any of you guys have uh, any questions, uh, please don't be shy and ask me because it's interesting. And because uh, uh, when we uh, share information, we can do better the procedures after that. Uh, so today I would like to discuss uh, tracheal bronchoscopy. It's, uh, uh, a visual, it's a visualization of uh, larynx, trachea, and uh, primary bronchi <clears throat> using the endoscope. <coughs> Uh, sorry for my coughing, it's uh, after COVID, COVID uh, complications. Uh, so uh, we know that uh, respiratory tract diseases uh, are common in pet rabbits. I think that uh, if you, uh, even if you don't work with rabbits, uh, maybe you have seen a rabbit with uh, uh, discharges from, nost from nostrils because pasteurylosis is very common condition and sometimes uh, rabbits uh, don't have uh, not only nose problems but uh, also uh, for example uh, problems with lungs or uh, any other points of respiratory tract uh, we have some problems with diagnosis uh, of these conditions uh, because it's impossible to treat animals just like a uh, rabbit has uh, uh, nasal discharge, okay, uh, let's uh, uh, give him, uh, let's give him an antibiotics. It doesn't work that way. Uh, it is more complicated than we want to think about. Uh, so uh, we need to, to introduce uh, uh, new tools of diagnostics uh, to uh, treat our patients better. Uh, tracheal bronchoscopy is non-invasive technique, but uh, the problem is about anesthesia. Uh, it's uh, not very difficult to do this procedure, but uh, uh, anesthetic protocol can be challenging for anesthesiologists. So <coughs> I think that it is uh, this problem about anesthesia is more important than uh, tracheal bronchoscopy itself. And uh, the good uh, thing is that uh, for rabbits, we can use the same equipment 
equipment uh, uh, that we use in dogs and cats. So uh, in most big clinics uh, in big cities in Russia, for example, uh, uh, the standard set of uh, endoscopic uh, rigid equipment uh, is so we can use it uh, without any problems. Uh, <clears throat> uh, let's discuss uh, some indications for this procedure. Uh, first of all, uh, we can vis visualize uh, the structures of rabbit respiratory tract. And uh, uh, after that, we can uh, see the problem and uh, decide what to do. So visualization is the first. Uh, we can do some diagnostic procedures uh, with uh, direct control, for example, bronchoalveolar lavage uh, from the uh, special point. Uh, we can take some samples for biopsy, for example, if we have a tumor. Uh, we can remove foreign bodies. It's uh, not about, uh, it's uh, uh, for diagnostic and for treatment. Uh, and uh, we have one case of state placement uh, in rabbit. It's, uh, it's, uh, it was a popular procedure in dogs about 10 years ago, but uh, right now we do it um, uh, more rare because <clears throat> Uh, uh, this procedure has a lot of uh, complications after, uh, but uh, we should know that in rabbits, in rabbits it is possible. Uh, so, and when we speak about uh, diseases, uh, we can uh, diagnose tracheitis uh, and the uh, different situations of airway obstruction. Uh, for example, foreign body in larynx and trachea and the primary bronchi. Uh, sometimes we do it uh, in combination with computer tomography and uh, the results are better when we use different uh, tools to diagnose uh, together. Uh, also, we can diagnose tracheal stenosis and uh, uh, the uh, bad thing is that uh, <coughs> in rabbits, tracheal stenosis uh, uh, in most cases is uh, uh, yeah, I don't remember how to <laughs> pronounce it. Yes, two days ago we discussed it, but I don't remember. Sorry. Iatrogenic. I am. Iatrogenic. We can diagnose tracheal collapse and different tumors. And uh, in rare cases, we can see external compression. For example, uh, the animal will have a tumor. Uh, somewhere not inside the uh, lum uh, wall of trachea, but uh, uh, we can see that uh, uh, trachea will be deformed because of uh, external compression. Okay, uh, so let's see what uh, we can read in the literature about uh, uh, usefulness of tracheobronchoscopy. Uh, there is an interesting case uh, of foreign body in trachea after nasogastric intubation in rabbit. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it is a sad uh, clinical case, I think, because uh, it's, uh, it is also iatrogenic. Uh, <clears throat> uh, so they uh, put uh, uh, nasogastric tube, uh, they removed it after, and uh, the rabbit starts to coughing after that, started coughing after that. <coughs> uh, <coughs> and uh, they, made, they made an X-ray and found uh, a tubular structure inside the trachea. Uh, you can see it uh, on the top image. Uh, after that, they performed tracheoscopia. Uh, and found the uh, part of nasogastric tube, uh, not in the esophagus, but in the trachea. Uh, so they removed it and uh, the clinical side resolved, the science resolved after that. And uh, when, so when we speak about uh, placing nasogastric tubes in rabbits, we should remember about this. And um, uh, every time we should check the length of the tube after removing, because if it is shorter than the thing, we should, uh, uh, we should um, uh, uh, make an X-ray for it 
to understand if uh, a part of it is inside rabbit or not. <clears throat> Uh, the next uh, condition is post-anesthetic tracheal structures, uh, strictures, and uh, we have a lot of cases uh, in literature about uh, uh, this condition. Uh, and uh, this condition is where is that uh, every anesthesiologist or exotic animal vet uh, is afraid of because. Uh, uh, for nowadays, we say that uh, tracheal intubation uh, in rabbits uh, is a gold standard of airway management. Uh, so uh, I perform tracheal intubation about three times a day of my working day. Uh, but uh, every time when I do it, I think that uh, in some rabbits, uh, I may have uh, complications and uh, this complication can be fatal for animal. Uh, so we have a surgery and uh, we perform uh, tracheal intubation. And if in two or three weeks after the procedure, uh, the animal start to have, uh, uh, the animal start, starts to have uh, breathing problems, uh, we should speak about, uh, we should think about <coughs> post anesthetic strictures. Uh, it is, um, a uh, really uh, useful technique for us to diagnose it uh, in combination with good analysis. So we uh, understand we understand that uh, uh, a rabbit uh, had a surgery with anesthesia, and uh, they should think that it may have a postanatetic stricture postenosis, and after that, uh, tracheal bronchoscopy is a good uh, option to diagnose it. <clears throat> Uh, and uh, we have one option, uh, uh, not one, but two different options to treat this stenosis. And uh, uh, in literature, we can find one uh, clinical case of treatment uh, it with uh, uh, stent placement, like in dogs with uh, tracheal collapse. And uh, we have the other case uh, uh, with tracheal anastomosis. Uh, it's when when we remove a part of the disease trachea and suture up uh, the rest parts. <clears throat> and uh, uh, we can found an article about uh, uh, tumors of larynx and tumor tumor of larynx and tumor of trachea in rabbit. And the interesting thing that they can. Uh, uh, primarily diagnose it uh, using X-ray, and the, on the image uh, you can see uh, uh, the tumor uh, inside the trachea, and it's interesting, I think, and it's really easy for us because uh, not every clinic has computer tomography or endoscopy, uh, so we can uh, make an X-ray, an X-ray, and just realize that uh, there is something inside. <clears throat> Uh, when we speak about infection disease, uh, uh, we will speak about inflammation and uh, we have a different uh, agents uh, which can uh, cause it. Uh, a lot of bacterial agents and the most popular uh, in rabbits uh, is Posteriola and Bordetella bronchiseptica. Uh, uh, also, we should remember about mycobacteriosis in rabbits. And uh, I had a presentation about it about, I think, some months ago on this <clears throat> conference. And uh, also we should remember about viral and mycotic con conditions. Uh, it's, uh, it's a story about Russia because we cannot diagnose it uh, using laboratory. We, don't, we just don't have uh, laboratories uh, which may confirm this diagnosis. And uh, right now we're in COVID condition, uh, we cannot uh, send samples to Europe to confirm it, uh, but uh, it's about viral disease, but uh, we should remember about that. So <coughs> to perform tracheal bronchoscopy, uh, we may need a rigid endoscope and uh, usually it's um, uh, uh, 18 centimeter length, and uh, it can be uh, different uh, di in different diameter. Uh, the classic one is uh, uh, 2.7 millimeters diameter, uh, 
but uh, in small rabbits, uh, it is better to use uh, smaller runs. Uh, for example, in my clinic, we have uh, one millimeter semi-rigid endoscope. Uh, it's a rare tube, <laughs> to be honest. I don't know if uh, any of our clinic in St. Petersburg and Moscow has it. Uh, it is expensive one, but uh, uh, for example, with one millimeter semi-rigid uh, tube, uh, we can perform tracheal bronchoscopy in, uh, even in rats. So uh, in all rabbits, we can do it. And uh, also we can use flexible bronchoscopes, uh, but uh, uh, we should use uh, uh, these uh, devices uh, with small millimeter, uh, with uh, small heads. Uh, and uh, it's, it is also a rare device for uh, clinics in Russia. Uh, so usually we, we use just uh, rigid endoscopes. Uh, what about anesthesia? It's, dif uh, it's difficult because uh, uh, rabbits uh, with uh, tracheal disease or uh, primary bronchi disease uh, will have uh, breathing problems. And anesthesia is difficult in, in animals with breathing problems. Uh, so uh, we should pre-oxygenate these animals. Uh, we place an IV catheter. Uh, usually we combinate <coughs> IV agents, for example, propofol and inhalant anesthesia, uh, we use isoflurane. Uh, we uh, continue to uh, give animal, uh, to give to animal oxygen during the procedure using uh, instrument channel or using mask to nostrils. And uh, to uh, enter the larynx, uh, we usually use lidocaine topically. Uh, and uh, uh, if we will use uh, the tube without shelter, uh, uh, without special covering to, uh, we should use mouth gags because if the animal will uh, wake up during the procedure, uh, the animal will uh, destroy the tube and uh, we know what endoscopes uh, uh, are really expensive devices. Uh, so here you can see, uh, how we perform uh, tracheal bronchoscopy in rabbit. Uh, on the bottom image, uh, uh, you can see rabbit in special uh, dental table for rodents and rabbits. Uh, and uh, it uh, really facilitates the procedure. And uh, on the uh, right image, you can see, uh, not image, but video. Uh, you can see how we do it and the rabbit is placed uh, with the head down and uh, on the screen you can see the trachea and a bifurcation of the ocarina. <clears throat> so uh, the next point uh, is that we should know anatomy really well because every time when we do something inside rabbit with endoscopes uh, we should understand where we are. So anatomy is our uh, queen of knowledge. <laughs> Uh, the rabbit has uh, uh, a unique, uh, uh, unique anatomy of the larynx. Uh, when we enter the mouth cavity, <coughs> uh, we can, uh, uh, after that, we go inside and we see uh, that a soft palate uh, is a, a rostral when the epiglottis. Uh, do you see my uh, pointer? Uh, yes, okay. we can see it. Uh, so this is a soft palate, and this is epiglottis. And the epiglottis is located uh, beneath the soft palate. For example, here uh, you can see a video. It's a soft palate. The rabbit is breathing. You can see it. And here you can see epiglottis, uh, which is located beneath. And uh, to enter uh, the larynx, uh, we should uh, push the soft pellet caudally, caudally. So for example, here, uh, we will do it. And this flap uh, is uh, epiglottis. And here you can see the laryngeal cartilages. And when we enter it, we can see the trachea. 
Uh, that's why uh, this uh, uh, structure of larynx uh, makes uh, rabbit intubation more difficult than intubation, uh, tracheal intubation in dogs and cats. Uh, that's why some years ago we said that, <coughs> sorry, we said that uh, rabbit intubation is almost impossible, but right now it's a routine procedure, but we have some um, special points how to do it carefully. Uh, uh, the anatomy of larynx of rabbit is almost the same as uh, in other animals. Uh, it consists of four cartilages. Uh, uh, what is interesting in rabbit? Uh, when we uh, when we pass through the larynx, we can see the trachea, uh, and uh, the trachea of rabbit has. Uh, uh, two lateral walls, one ventral wall and one dorsal wall. Dorsal wall is a membrane which uh, is uh, white in color. And uh, you can see here that uh, all our three walls are uh, pink or red. And this is normal. If we will perform uh, tracheoscopy scopy in, in dog, uh, in this situation, we will speak about uh, tracheitis, acute, acute tracheitis, and the, in rabbit uh, is just normal, so don't mess it up. Uh, uh, and we uh, uh, go through trachea uh, after we, sorry, uh, uh, it's a place uh, where trachea is divided into two primary bronchi. Uh, and this place is called Karina in uh, uh, English literature. And uh, uh, each uh, primary bronchus uh, is divided on secondary bronchus. And we have a, a really good article uh, about uh, uh, bronch bronchial tree anatomy in rabbit. Uh, so if you uh, are going to perform uh, tracheobronchoscopy in rabbits, uh, please read it and understand it because anatomy is really important for us. And uh, what is interesting uh, in rabbits, what is also interesting in rabbits that uh, different authors uh, say to us that uh, rabbits uh, uh, have different uh, numbers of, uh, of uh, lobes of lungs. Uh, I don't like this situation, but is, is, this situation is common for exotic animal uh, yet because uh, we lack information in traditional sources. So just uh, we have to live with it. Uh, uh, of course, rabbits uh, have right and left lungs, uh, but <coughs> when we speak about lobes of lungs, uh, we, we can find a different information. For example, some of us say that uh, left lung uh, has cranial and caudal lobes, just two. And uh, our authors say, say that, uh, uh, for example, left lung has three lobes. It's cranial, middle, and caudal. Uh, and that's why, uh, because uh, uh, their lobes uh, don't have uh, a really uh, good septa between them. So on the top image, you can see that this is uh, a part of a uh, left lung, uh, but uh, we, uh, it's impossible for us to say, is it uh, two different lobules or it's just a big one with a small septa uh, between them. Uh, that's why uh, different uh, offers say different things. <clears throat> uh, so here you can see how we perform it. Uh, it's uh, uh, the red uh, mucosa of trachea, and uh, uh, we know that this is normal for rabbits. After red, we can see uh, carina. It's a bifurcation of the trachea into two uh, primary bronchi. Uh, Okay, you can see the movement of the wall. It's uh, hard. It's uh, hard working. And we can go inside the primary bronco. Uh, the, uh, also rabbits have uh, uh, a more acute angle uh, 
in the, in the bifurcation in comparison with cats. So if uh, the specialists uh, work with cats a lot, uh, he, it, he will be surprised about this because it's, it's um, more difficult to enter the primary bronchus in rabbit than in cats. When we can go inside the primary bronch bronchus and we can see the uh, secondary bronchia. <clears throat> it's a normal rabbit. It's uh, not a diseased one. And when we go out. Okay, so uh, tracheobronchoscopy is an easy and non-invasive technique. So we should use it. Uh, and uh, it's uh, <coughs> strange for me and for my understanding why we don't use it uh, really. Uh, uh, why we, we don't use it uh, often, not that often when in dogs and cats. Uh, we can use standard equipment, equipment, and so we just don't need to buy something for rabbits. We can use uh, uh, all the uh, devices when we, that we use in dogs and cats. And uh, uh, this procedure is not that popular, so we don't have a lot of experience. And uh, uh, that's why, and we don't have a lot of literature information about the diseases that we can diagnose. Uh, so we should collect the information. I will speak and uh, I want our guys to speak and uh, to tell us uh, the, the clinical cases to collect the information and to know better what to do with rabbits with uh, tracheal and primary bronchi diseases. Thank you for your attention. I think, I, I hope that uh, everybody understands what I, I said. No, absolutely, absolutely. And well done if, uh, if you have COVID or you're recovering, you did very well. I think I, I would probably still be in bed if I had COVID, so well done. Does anyone have any questions for Marina? If you do, then write them in the chat. Don't be shy. Uh, Marina, I don't have a question, but uh, very well done uh, pronouncing the words that we practiced. I know how hard it can be, <laughs> but you did great. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to our last speaker now, um, which is uh, Ivan, Ivan Madakov. Um, and Ivan will be talking about, well, can I, I can pronounce this, prosthetic crowns in dogs. So I actually can say that one. So Ivan, over to you. Yeah, hi, colleagues. Uh, so one minute. Nervous. Uh -huh, okay. Mm -hmm. So I didn't find uh, where is from the, ah, oh, maybe I should, this one. <laughs> um, we can see it anyway. Yeah, it's fine as it is. Yeah, yeah, okay. I think it'll be okay. Yeah, if you can't. Yeah, just, uh, I want to do like how it, it should be, but mm -hmm. because of when I, uh, open all window so it, because of the zooms ah yeah what yeah yeah now ah, you got it better, yeah great now there you go there okay cool all right over to you mm -hmm. so hi colleagues uh, thank you for previous lecture it was very interesting but i don't understand <laughs> clearly <laughs> what they about talk so I think it's uh, very difficult to hear it. Uh, people who don't know any uh, something information about vets, yes. Uh, and uh, um, I try to explain my topics, uh, and I uh, restrict the information from my lecture because uh, the, that is a general lecture, and uh, I hope it will help other vets to better understand the problem because 
sometimes the the prosthetic crown looks like some kind of dog dog yes um, so that is why i just want to bring some information um, how it's important uh, first of all for animals and the second one uh, for owners for pet parents of those dogs, dogs. Uh, so I'm uh, uh, Dr. Makarov, uh, head doctor of veterinary clinic, and I'm the dentist. Uh, I pay attention on the dentistry from to, uh, since 2003. So uh, let's start. Uh, the tooth fracture is the second uh, most common problem after periodontology. So it is uh, about 50% of uh, of dogs uh, have a problem with the teeth just a fracture or maybe sometimes they remove they can remove teeth well during the process of biting and uh, especially in 90 percent or 95 percent uh, it's really a high percentage and dogs who uh, have a Sports, exercise, maybe uh, uh, animals for hunting, for sports, and for other very active, uh, maybe games or competition. And uh, uh, indication for use the prosthetic crowns or maybe just other kind of crowns is, uh, first of all, it's a purposes uh, for the purposes of sport hunting, security animals, and the um, I think, sorry to interrupt. Animal. I think Ivan, maybe you should turn off your camera because um, your your connection okay, is okay. breaking up. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, okay. So now it's good. Uh, a little uh, bit better. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, okay. You. Good. Uh, so um, I repeat uh, the first one. Uh, the indica indication for use for purposes of sport, hunting, security animals, and other activities, as I told in uh, in previous slide. Uh, the same. It's abrasion of teeth, and that is not uh, necessary. This is dog for hunting or security, etc. Sometimes dogs just to play with uh, um, mm, with uh, toys, just balls for tennis and etc. And uh, I will show you these cases, and uh, we can find uh, how mm, the teeth uh, become like abrasion. The uh, the crown is uh, less than in normal, become less than a normal. Uh, so. The purpose to protect of tooth from injury. Also, if there are teeth, uh, the number of teeth, teeth, teeth I show you, uh, there is a canine teeth and there is a very uh, big teeth in mouth because um, those two teeth influence on, uh, uh, very often injured from uh, toys, uh, uh, also play the main role in inclusion. Uh, so the orthodontic pathology, I think it's on the past, um, uh, on, on the deeper side. Yes, and uh, the, uh, because sometimes the relationships of the relation of uh, uh, during the canine. Uh, um, the, we can't find the, any problems orthodontic. I mean, when the uh, teeth uh, became uh, displaced, to will displace from their previous uh, place, just uh, abnormal anatomy we can find in this, and we call this uh, orthodontic pathology. But uh, uh, we can find it very, uh, very seldom. So that is why I fix it in the last one from those. Uh, uh, psychology of dogs. 
this is a major point why we should do this. And uh, uh, first of all, uh, the dogs, when the dogs bite in something, uh, they reduce the stress. Yes, and uh, uh, that is why it's very important to give them uh, uh, right uh, toys. Yes, special toys. You should pay attention on it, how we should uh, um, find uh, the right uh, the, the right toys and uh, what you think we should uh, understand about this. Uh, be calm, the animals become calm. Uh, there are no barking or maybe do not bite something, sofa, et cetera, and other furniture. It's very important. Uh, especially if uh, animal live in uh, in apartment flats, yes, uh, and uh, instead of this, not too far, just in the countryside. Um, take a balance. Uh, this is a, also about nervous system and a good habit. Do not bite anything, as I told, to control itself and be friendly. So this is just, um, you know, uh, Sometimes it looks like uh, not serious. This is, uh, it looks like uh, this is a small problem, but we know from other psychologists there is really important. And uh, I think if we, um, uh, if we made this presentation with other psychologists, they add to these uh, points <laughs> a lot of very important uh, advices yes and uh, mm, uh, for owner uh, the same it's very uh, important for owner because the owner can back to their previous lifestyles the same uh, how his uh, pet yes it means uh, like uh, pet owner because if uh, the pet owner a dog, they have a habit to go outside and play with uh, toys, uh, hunting, do something, sport exercise, etc. For them, this is lifestyle. Yes, and uh, if do, uh, dog do not have uh, any teeth, uh, the the dogs can't bite something, can't play. So the, that is a different time become. And uh, for uh, sometimes for, for both of that, it's a difficult time. Uh, do not waste time, what it means. Because all a good pet parents should pay a lot of time on their, uh, their uh, pets. And uh, in previous time, they go a lot of, uh, they spend a lot of time outside of the country, as I told, uh, to the countryside, uh, that, uh, as I told. And uh, so that is why it's really important uh, because um, animal learn, the dog learn some very major skills, very important skills for hunting, for etc., for sport games. Yes, and uh, sometimes you should um, spend one or three years for that. So, and then when the uh, pet can do the same exercise, yes, because of the teeth. Uh, so it's uh, the owner waste their time. Now we really know, um, we don't have any much important than time, yes. Uh, there is uh, the time don't have uh, any any cost yeah uh, and add to this there, there's enjoy communication with dog uh, like in this picture so we can do both things we can spend time together and that is very important for both sides and uh, dog without teeth when Dog do not have uh, don't do any exercise. It's <laughs> this is like a kind of joke. Yes, you can sell me, but you uh, you can't uh, stand it, but you 
sorry, I didn't find. You can't sell me. Uh, you can't only buy me. Yes, uh, it looks like some kind of joke. And what, uh, what else? Uh, if we look at, the, at these pictures, so we can find some abrasion. Uh, oh, I didn't show this attrition the same because it has a malocclusion problem. And uh, we treated uh, canine teeth 404. Uh, it's a uh, canine, it, uh, it's located uh, in the mandible on the right side. And how we can uh, see uh, in den dental x ray. Yes, there was uh, endodontic treatments. And then we prepare a tooth crown. Uh, and, uh, and next one, we made an impression. And this impression we will send, uh, we send to laboratory, special dentistry laboratory where made uh, a crown. The crown, uh, we uh, use uh, several, uh, several types. Just uh, in major, there are uh, two types. In cobalt crown, yes, uh, it's really better for and for Circonium crown. Uh, it looks similar to uh, uh, the same color, but they don't have uh, a good flexible. So that is why when the um, uh, the big, especially big dog, bites something, uh, the crown can be injured and can be broken. But I never see. I didn't see uh, those uh, these cases how zirconium crown become broken. Yes, uh, but uh, we know on the special uh, from special literature the cobalt crown uh, where uh, the the cobalt crown very uh, stronger than zirconium crown because of the flexible major that is a major point so that is why we use a uh, special co color table if we can find uh, uh, you uh, can you see my uh, arrow yeah uh, yes uh, we can yeah, yeah we can yeah uh, so there is a, a special like a table color table and we uh, we should compare and which kind of color will be better. And of course, there are not one, only one color. Or yes, because uh, close to the gingiva, we should uh, use maybe A3, but by the middle side, it will be A2, and the sharp side of, uh, of the canine, we should maybe use um, B1. So it's, uh, um, it connected with the color and with uh, mm, uh, it's very individual we don't have any mm, special uh, table like uh, this is uh, uh, this is a separate dog yes three years old even if we should use uh, like uh, this color so it's uh, this is very individual work uh, and for laboratory uh, of course too uh, so what a beautiful view. Uh, a lot of uh, dentists compare the <laughs> tooth crown with the mountains and maybe, yeah, it sometimes looks similar. And um, there was uh, a fractured teeth and the same, there was uh, uh, injured uh, gingiva. Uh, we can find because, uh, we can find it because it looks like you, uh, you see the gingiva, it don't have a, a good line, like uh, a normal line. They have some, in some places, they have just the line is broken. Yes, there was a trauma because. And uh, uh, on what thing we can pay attention? For, of course, for exhibition dogs, we should do uh, prosthetic crowns, like with very good view. 
and uh, it looks like the similar tooth uh, without any without any indication like uh, this is a, a prosthetic crown but for work dogs for sport dogs hunting yes etc security dogs uh, sometimes um, in major points we maybe have uh, a little bit area about one millimeters close to the gingiva without crown we do not uh, all area all crown area we do not cover the prosthetic crowns uh, so that is a, uh, this is a major point because uh, for animals uh, the pet parents can't clean teeth uh, can't good clean teeth uh, so that is why if we do this just a little bit under gingiva then uh, in the future we will find uh, calculus etc and uh, we in the future, we will find recession in this area. So that is why it uh, will be a little bit better when we just uh, uh, have uh, a little bit uh, area uh, close to the gingiva, about one millimeters, uh, and uh, we do not cover all crown, uh, our prosthetics crown. Uh, so there is... Uh, other cases uh, that is uh, uh, doctor yes, seven years old, as I know, uh, today them uh, it has uh, uh, eleven years, and uh, they are fixed the same in the same <laughs> teeth. Um, we don't have any problem with uh, this crown. Um, only problem with uh, with teeth, like in these uh, cases. And of course, periodontology will become, um, and uh, there was extracted several teeth because of periodontitis. And um, <clears throat> also in this crown, we use a pin lay. Why we, why we used it? Because <clears throat> we don't have a, a, a really crown. You, if you look on the left side of the slide, yes, there, without any maybe crown area, though there's maybe 15 or 10 percent of canine crown we have under the uh, we have uh, uh, under gingiva, yes. So that is why we try to prepare it very carefully, and we made uh, special pins because it helps us. Uh, to fix it much better than just uh, we cover this uh, crown, the prosthetics crown, the zirconium crown. And we use special coal, it looks like gold, but of course there is not gold. And uh, this is after, of, uh, after examination. Of course, we should check uh, occlusion. Yes, that's very important. And uh, there is a zirconium crown. And of course, when we uh, use a camera, it looks like a, a little bit bigger than, uh, uh, th than the other canine, but we can do a smaller one because a special program which made this zirconium crown can make it uh, thinner. Uh, the walls of this crown uh, um, do not thin how we uh, how we can mate in general for these uh, animals, and so that is why we use uh, uh, special bores. We made a surface and we made it a little bit uh, less than the previous uh, than it was a previous uh, and previous uh, crown from laboratory, but uh, in addition of this, uh, we didn't exclude uh, mm, uh, the big, <laughs> we, we do not exclude uh, uh, the views, like uh, this is a much, a little bit bigger than it should be, yes. But uh, how I told the animals is very small. Uh, we, you can compare it with my fingers and uh, the same, the teeth of those animals is too small. And just a program of zirconium cry 
do not allow to do uh, the crown smaller than this one. So this is zirconium crown. It looks the same like a teeth. And uh, because this is a dog, or sorry, because this is a cat, uh, it do not uh, catch something and do not bite something. Uh, how dogs and for these animals, uh, this is uh, uh, acceptable to do uh, the same crown like Athena, then it should be. Uh, it was a trauma, as I remember, maybe three months um, ago, and we do we did uh, endodontic treatments and prosthetic crowns, and this is just uh, examination. And the same, you can find uh, the gingiva was uh, injured from, uh, as I know, from bone or maybe from horn or from, from uh, dirt horn. Uh, if, I, uh, if I call it correct, uh, from uh yes one minute uh oh dear dear uh, uh, from dear or uh, horn uh so this is why we should pay uh, from dear horn we should try to pay attention uh on this very uh very difficult for biting uh subjects uh, uh what else uh it because uh, mm, so, so very very strong very mm, hard things it influence on the teeth of dog and uh, of course for mm, pet parents sometimes it looks like unusual how dogs can uh, can fractured teeth from bones, some kind of bones or some other hard things. For them, it uh, looks like unusual, but we should pay attention on this. Just uh, they should use special uh, toys for that. Maybe if they use some things like uh, mm, tools or some sticks, it uh, the dog should be just uh, do not bite it, just to maybe play like, just to take it and uh, give uh, the owner and then then should play like without any biting of these uh, hard uh, things. So this is very important. And uh, as I told you in the previous slides, uh, this is the dog, uh, this is a um, abrasion. This is dog plays just, uh, a tennis ball, yes, and uh, we did uh, endodontic treatments for these dogs. Uh, they do not allow to use prosthetic crowns because of the price, but after one year, they become to our practice and the show. This tooth, uh, of course, the, uh, the crown of the tooth, the canines and crown uh, become uh, a shorter than in previous, it was a previous time. Uh, and we can see the seals is goes down because of, of the abrasion from a uh, tennis ball. And uh, so that is why we retreated and we did uh, the same endotic tr treatments and prosthetic crowns. Also, so it looks like uh, after we fix it, the prosthetic crowns, uh, there is uh, zirconium crowns. And uh, after that, there are no, um, these animals uh, didn't have any problems with these teeth. So other dog, uh, the left side was injured from horses. The right side was injured from sticks. And there is after, sorry, there is after we fix it. Prosthetic crowns. Uh, 
and uh, this is a dog for sport for Ipo, as I know it, uh, how it call it calls, and uh, how it works. So we should do the prosthetic crowns our treatment uh, much stronger than for people because uh, how you see there is very a lot of forces um, and uh, the dog bite very strong to strong enough and of course if we uh, treat it um, not good like just uh, if we treated it like for <laughs> for humans so there is do not allow it because uh, our crown is goes down, just uh, the tooth will be broken because of these uh, forces. So that is very important. And uh, can you feel any differences there? So sometimes it looks really like a shark teeth. And uh, for us, it looks like a <laughs> beautiful uh, cases but maybe because my speciality influence on my mind <laughs> so in conclusion uh, prosthetic uh, crowns help us to restore the tooth function as well as cover and protect the tooth crown it's very important and major point uh, point is to help to go back to to the previous lifestyles so uh, there is a lot of pluses for dogs and for pet parents and that is very important thank you for your attention thank you if you have any questions please i i will answer on it uh, ivan thank, thank you very, you much, very much thank you uh, um, there is a question from maria nagorna uh, yep. so uh, why can we see some depigmentation on the cheek mucosa in the crown area uh one minute uh where is uh this one uh maria if you <laughs> can please talk to us you'll help us in this uh, yes slide, so yes in this slide you mean like this area yeah on the mucosa of uh cheek yeah i think that's what marina maria meant yeah hello sorry uh yeah it's about this uh area of mucosa it's uh oh, yeah, okay the direction of the crown mm -hmm. there were uh, it was injury from sticks uh, or dirt uh dirt honor uh so when the dog was bite it's uh, uh injured herself so that is why this is just uh, uh the mucosa just uh, regenerate, will regenerate, mm -hmm. and we can find it. Uh, it marks on this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. You are very welcome. Okay. And one question from Marina: Do you have any experience with the prosthetic crowns in animals other than dogs and cats? Yes, we had. We made it uh, for monkeys, but uh, we mm, and wolf. And several wolves there was, uh, so it's uh, it worked the same, and uh, and I hope we will do uh, similar works with wild animals uh, uh, very often in the future. Uh, so because uh, for me, first of all, I love my job. For me, this is very interesting, and maybe I will show you other very beautiful cases, in my opinion. <laughs> Okay, one well, thank you. And uh, one more question from Anna. So what is the price of uh, Siconium crowns, like starting from and uh, to? Oh, it's uh, starting from uh, 32,000 rubles to 42,000 rubles. It depends on the weight. It depends on the, what kind of fracture the pet parents uh, want to fix it on their animals. Just uh, Cobalt cronium crown or zirconium crown, and uh, it depends on the how difficult work should be on this tooth, how it uh, was deeper injured. Uh, 
because sometimes preparation uh, spend a lot of time if we have very difficult injury on the crown. If okay, we see, great. If we, yeah, so. Great, thank you, Ivan. Um, and has anyone thought of a question from any, for any of the other speakers? Yeah. Whilst Ivan's been on, has anyone got any other questions for anyone else? Or are you all too shy? Um, okay, anyway, thank you very much to all the speakers. You've all done very, very well. Um, you've pronounced some really hard words, words which I can't pronounce. Thank you. So everyone's done really well. Um, and I hope it was useful for you, uh, for you all, for people listening, for people presenting. Um, and if it's inspired you to learn English, then please get in touch with us. We'll be yeah. happy to talk to you. Um, so enjoy your Sunday, everyone. Um, Thank you so stay much. Stay warm. And we will see you next time. Okay. Take care. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye.